Howdy, 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 my name is Anashi Sasuke, and welcome back to Let's Read Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Scary, scary tales? Oh, it's right there, I'm stupid. But I said it right! Okay, scary stories to tell in the dark. Alright, cool, cool. Um, in this episode, we're gonna be reading the chapter, They Eat Your Eyes, They Eat Your Nose, and it says... Wait, is there a way to make this look... Yes, toggle full screen. That's the one I want. There are scary stories about all kinds of things. The ones told here are about a grave, a witch, and a man who liked to swim, a hunting trip, and a market basket. There are also one about worms eating a corpse. Your corpse. I wonder if they'll be screaming in this one. Well, there's the hearse song. I don't know what the tune of the hearse song is, I'm just going to read it. Don't you ever laugh as the hearse goes by, for you may be the next to die. They wrap you up in a big white sheet from your head down to your feet. They put you in a big black box and cover you up with dirt and rocks. All goes well for about a week, then your coffin begins to leak. The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, the worms play a pinnacle on your snout. They eat your eyes, they eat your nose, they eat the jelly between your toes. A big green worm with rolling eyes crawls in your stomach and out your eyes. Your stomach turns a slimy green and pus pours out like whipping cream. You spread it on a slice of bread and that's what you eat when you are dead. A. Well, we got right into the one about your corpse getting eaten, but who laughs at hearses? Is that a is that a problem that they had in the eighties, nineties, whenever this book came out? Oh, it it shows it, but I mean, I don't know what these musical notes mean. So, and here's the one for the girl who stood on a grave. Some boys and girls were at a party one night. There was a graveyard down the street, and they were talking about how scary it was. Don't you ever stand on a grave after dark, one of the boys said. The person inside will grab you. He'll pull you under. That's not true, one of the girls said. It's just a superstition. I'll give you a dollar if you stand on a grave, said the boy. A grave doesn't scare me, said the girl. I'll do it right now. Ow. Hit my keyboard. The boy handed her his knife. Stick this knife in one of the graves. Then we'll show you where they were. Or, then we'll know you were there. The graveyard was filled with shadows and was as quiet as death. I mean, it's full of dead bodies, but what else is going to be quiet as? There's, there's nothing to be scared of, the girl told herself, but she was scared anyway. She picked out a grave and stood on it. Then, quickly, she bent over and plunged the knife into the soil, and she started to leave. But she couldn't get away. Something was holding her back. She tried a second time to leave, but she couldn't move. She was filled with terror. Something has got me! She screamed as she fell to the ground. When she didn't come back, the others went to look for her. They found her body sprawled across the grave. Without realizing it, she had plunged the knife through her skirt and had pinned it to the ground. It was only the skirt that it was only the knife that held her. She had died of fright. That's rough. Now it's time for a new horse. Two farmhands shared a room. One slept at the back of the room. The other slept near the door. After a while, the one who slept near the door began to feel very tired early in the day. He asked his friend asked what was wrong. An awful thing happens every night, he said. A witch turns me into a horse and rides me all over the countryside. I'll, I'll sleep in your bed tonight, his friend said. We'll see what happens to me. About midnight, an old woman who lived nearby came into the room. She mumbled some strange words over the farmhand, and he found he couldn't move. Then she slipped a bridle on him, and he turned into a horse. The next thing he knew, she was riding him across the fields at breakneck speed, beating him to make him go even faster. Soon they came to a house where a party was going on. There was a lot of music and dancing. They were having a big time inside. She hitched him to a fence and went in. While she was gone, the farmhand rubbed against the fence until the bridle came off and he turned back into a human being. Then he went into the house and found the witch. He spoke those strange words over her and with the bridle he turned HER into a horse. Then he rode her to, the, to a blacksmith and had her fitted with horseshoes. After that, he rode to the farm where she lived. I have a pretty good filly here, he told her husband, but I need a stronger horse. Would you like to trade? The old man looked her over and he said he would do it. So they picked out another horse and the farmhand rode away. Her husband led his new horse to the barn. He took off the bridle and went to hang it up, but when he came back, the new horse was gone. Instead, there stood his wife with horseshoes nailed to her hands and feet. It, it's a picture of a horse, but with high-heeled shoes. Well, excuse me, there's a hoof, and then another hoof, and then a human leg, and then a human leg with a high-heeled shoe on. Alligators. A young woman in town married a man from another part of the country. 
He was a nice fellow, and they got along pretty well together. There was only one problem. Every night he'd go swimming in the river. Sometimes he'd be gone all night long, and she would complain about how lonely she was. This couple had two young sons. As soon as the boys could walk, their father began to teach, teach them how to swim. And when they got to be old enough, he took them swimming in the river at night. Often they would stay there all night long, and the young woman would stay at home by herself. After a while, she began to act in a strange way. At least that's what the neighbors said. She told them that her husband was turning into an alligator and that he was trying to turn the boys into alligators. Everyone, everybody told her there was nothing wrong with a man taking his son swimming. That was a natural thing to do. And when it came to the alligators, they, they, there just weren't any nearby. Everyone knew that. Early one morning, the young woman came running into town from the direction of the river. She was soaking wet. She said a big alligator and two little alligators had pulled her in and had tried to get her to eat a raw fish. They were her husband and her son, she said, and they wanted her to live with them. But she'd gotten away. Her doctor had decided she'd lost her mind, and he had put her in a hospital for a while. After that, nobody saw her husband and boys again. They just disappeared. But now and then a fisherman would tell about seeing alligators in the river at night. Usually it was one big alligator and two small ones. But people said they were just making it up. Everybody knows there aren't any alligators around here. Unless they're all alligators. Also, that I'm that doesn't look like an alligator. That looks like some sort of, like demon with vague alligator bits unless it's just weirdly portrayed because it looks like the teeth are I don't know room for one more a man named Joseph Blackwell came to Philadelphia on a business trip he stayed with his friends in that big house they owned outside the city that night they had a good time visiting but when Blackwell went to bed he tossed and turned and couldn't sleep sometime during the night he heard a car turn into the driveway he went to the window to see who it was arriving at such a late hour. In the moonlight, he saw a long black hearse filled with people. The driver of the hearse looked up at him. When Blackwell saw his queer, hideous face, he shuddered. The driver called to him. There's room for one more. Then he waited for a minute or two and he drove off. In the morning, Blackwell told his friends what had happened. You were dreaming, they said. I must have been, he said, but it didn't seem like a dream. After breakfast, he went into Philadelphia. He spent the day high above the city in one of the new office buildings there. Late in the afternoon, he was waiting for an elevator to take him down to the street, but when it arrived, it was very crowded. One of the passengers looked out and called to him. There's room for one more, he said. It was the driver of the hearse. No thanks, said Blackwell. I'll, I'll get the next one. The doors closed and the elevator started down. There was shrieking and screaming, then the sound of a crash. The elevator had fallen to the bottom of the shaft. Everyone aboard was killed. Is that, is that really how the story ends? I kind of thought it was going to go a bit longer than that. Like, maybe he was going to go home and then the guy was going to show up again and be like, there is still room for one more. And then drag him into the hearse anyway. The Wendigo. A wealthy man wanted to go hunting in a part of northern Canada where few people had ever hunted. He traveled to a trading post and tried to find a guy to take him, but no one would do it. It was too dangerous, they said. Finally, he found an Indian who needed money badly, and he agreed to take him. The Indian's name was Defago. Def Defago? They made camp in the snow near a large frozen lake. For three days they hunted, but they had nothing to show for it. The third night, a windstorm came up. They lay in their tent listening to the wind howling and the trees whipping back and forth. To see the storm better, the hunter opened the tent flap. What he saw startled him. There wasn't a breath of air stirring and the trees were standing perfectly still. Yet he could hear the wind howling, and the more he listened, the more it sounded as if it were calling Defago's name. Or, I guess it's Defago. Defago, it called. Defago! I must be losing my mind, the hunter thought. But Defago had gotten out of his sleeping bag. He was huddled in a corner of the tent, his head buried in his arms. What's this all about? The hunter said, or asked. It's nothing, DeFago said. But the wind continued to call to him, and DeFago became more tense and more restless. DeFago, it called. DeFago! Suddenly, he jumped to his feet and he began to run from the tent. But the hunter grabbed him and wrestled him to the ground. You can't leave me out here, the hunter shouted. Then the wind called again and DeFago broke loose and ran into the darkness. The hunter could hear him screaming as he went. Again and again he cried, Oh, my fiery feet, my burning feet of fire! Then his voice faded away and the wind died down. At daybreak, the hunter followed Defago's tracks in the snow. 
They went through the woods down towards the lake and then out onto the ice, but soon he noticed something strange. The steps DeFago had taken got longer and longer. They were so, so long no human being could have taken them. It was as if something had helped him to hurry away. The hunter followed the tracks out to the middle, middle of the lake, but there they disappeared. At first he thought that DeFago had fallen through the ice, but there wasn't any hole. Then he thought that something had pulled him off the ice into the sky, but that made no sense. As he stood wondering what had happened, the wind picked up again. Soon it was howling as it had the night before. Then he heard DeFago's voice. It was coming from up above, and again he heard DeFago screaming, My fiery feet! My burning feet! But there was nothing to be seen. Now the hunter wanted to leave that place as fast as he could. He went back to camp and packed. Then he left some food for DeFago and he started out. Weeks later he reached civilization. The following year he went back to hunt in that area again. He went to the same trading post to look for a guide. The people there could not explain what had happened to DeFago that night. But they had not seen him since then. Maybe it was the Wendigo, one of them said. And he laughed. It was supposed to come with the wind. It drags you along at great speed until your feet are burned away, and, and more of you than that. Then it carries you into the sky and it drops you. It's just a crazy story, but that's what some of the Indians say. A few days later, the hunter was at the trading post again. An Indian came in and sat by the fire. He had a blanket wrapped around him and he wore his hat so that you couldn't see his face. The hunter thought there was something familiar about him. He walked over and he asked, Are you DeFago? The Indian didn't answer. Do you know anything about him? No answer. He began to wonder if something was wrong, if the man needed help. But he couldn't see his face. Are you alright? He asked. No answer. To get a look at him, he lifted the Indian's hat. Then he screamed. There was nothing under the hat but a pile of ashes. Ha hmm. <clears throat> and that brings us to the next chapter. I, I, unless this is the same chapter. No, it's, a new ch it's, it's another story. The Dead Man's Brains. This scary story is a scary game that people play at Halloween, or excuse me, Halloween, but it can be played where, whenever the spirit moves you. The players sit in a circle in a darkened room and listen to a storyteller describe the rotting remains of a corpse. Each part is passed around for them to feel. In one version, a player is out of here, she screams or gasps with fright. In another version, everybody stays to the end no matter how scared they get. Here's the story. Once in this town, there lived a man named Brown. It was years ago, on this night, that he was murdered out of spite. We have here his remains. First, let's feel his brains, a wet, squishy tomato. Now I hear his eyes, still frozen with surprise. Two peeled grapes. This is his nose, a chicken bone. Here is his ear, a dried apricot. And here is his hand, rotting flesh and bone, a cloth of rubber glove filled with mud or ice. But his hair still grows, a, hand f a handful of corn silk or wet fur or yarn. And his heart still beats now and then, a piece of raw liver. And his blood still flows. Dip your fingers in it. It's nice and warm, a bowl of uh, catsup thinned with warm water. That's all there is, except for these worms. They're the ones that ate the rest of him, a handful of wet cooked spaghetti noodles. May I carry your basket? Sam Lewis spent the evening playing chess at his friend's house. It was about midnight when they finished their game and he started home. That's a long game of chess. Outside it was icy cold and as quiet as the grave. As he came around a turn in the road, he was surprised to see a woman walking ahead of him. She was carrying a basket covered with a white cloth. When he caught up to her, he looked to see who it was. But she was so bundled up against the cold, it was hard to see her face. Good evening, Sam said. What brings you out so late? But she didn't answer. Then he, then he said, May I carry your basket? She handed it to him. From under the cloth, a small voice said, That's very nice of you. And that was followed by a wild laughter. Sam was so startled that he dropped the basket and out rolled a woman's head. He looked at the head, and he stared at the woman. It's her head! He cried, and he started to run, and the woman and her head began to chase him. Soon the head caught up to him. It bounded into the air and sunk its teeth into his left leg. Sam screamed with pain and ran faster. But the woman and her head stayed right behind. Soon the head leaped into the air again and bit into his other leg. Then they were gone. Other dangers. Okay, so that's the next chapter, which says, Most of the scary stories in this book have been passed down over the years, but the ones in this chapter have been told only in recent times. They are stories that young people often tell about dangers we face in our lives today. I wonder what that'll be like since this book happened, like, I think, before I existed. Or maybe right around that time. 
But for now, that about does it for this episode of Let's Read Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, now that I know I was saying the title the right way. If you liked it, a like and a subscribe will be groovy. If you didn't, you don't need to do either one of those things. And I'll see you all in the next one. Later!